Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the Latin American independence movements of the early 1800s. Um, so make sure you guys have your guided notes with you that you're following along as we go through this. Um, okay. Well, if this will load. Here we go. Okay, so what you guys see in this one, this is a mural in Mexico, and you'll find that murals are actually really popular art forms um, in Latin America and particularly in Mexico. Um, and this is a scene depicting um, Father Hidalgo in the middle in his um, kind of bid for Mexican independence. Um, one thing that's unique about Father Hidalgo is that um, he actually leads the lower classes in the independence movement. Um, and that's kind of in contrast to some of our other revolutions that we've talked about. And for that reason, he's seen as pretty dangerous and not really um, a popular guy. So he's eventually um, going to be killed before he sees his movement come to fruition. Um, <clears throat> and you see a lot of depictions of a class struggle here. Um, you can see the Creoles and the Peninsulares here with the natives over here, and it does a really good job at depicting our class struggle. Um, most of our Latin American independence movements are going to be Creole-led. Um, and similar to the American Revolution, they're wanting to throw off this idea of mercantilism. Um, they're fighting for economic freedom. They're fighting for um, like a political... They're fighting for property rights, and they're also fighting for a voice in government. Um, the Latin American movements are by no means in this stage fighting for a social revolution of equality for all. Um, so in that regard, they're more similar to kind of the American Revolution than the French Revolution. Um, it's going to take later movements in the early 1900s to really um, find this equality revolution in Latin America. Okay, so just to review real quick, um, <clears throat> most of Latin America is controlled by the Spanish and the Portuguese. Um, this map kind of cuts it off, but um, the Spanish actually control a lot of territory up in North America. They're going to control the West Coast all the way up to Oregon um, through New Spain, um, Central America. Um, Spain's going to have the West Coast of South America, and Brazil is under control of the Portuguese. Um, so it's a huge amount of land that they have control of. Okay, and just to review our social hierarchy, we've talked about this a couple times, but just want to reemphasize the importance. At the very top of this hierarchy, you're going to have the Peninsulares, who are your native Spaniards. They were born on the Iberian Peninsula, which is where Spain and Portugal are, so Peninsula Peninsulares. Um, and Spain really likes this idea of having native Spaniards ruling the colonies, they're going to send these guys over kind of as viceroys or governors to really ensure that this mercantilist system is working. Um, if Spain's, they feel that if Spain's going to benefit from this system, then the best way is to have, um, you know, native Spaniards kind of in control. Um, so they're at the very, very top, and they're going to get the highest positions in government and society. Um, below them you have the Creoles who are in every sense of the word European except for the fact that they were born in the New World. Um, so just by virtue of where they were born, they have a lower social status. Um, they do occupy a lot of the higher positions or a lot of the landowners, um, but they're not the ones in control. They don't have a lot of say in government. Um, what ends up happening with a lot of these Creoles is because they are European and they want to give them like a lead best advantages in life, they'll send them over to Europe or the Americas to be educated, um, where they come into contact with the Enlightenment ideas and bring those ideas back into um, Latin America. But um, Creoles, um, their big frustration is that they're denied um, political power. Um, below the Creoles, you have the Mestizos, who are Indian and European. Um, this is going to be mestizos, um, mostly in Spa um, Spanish Latin America, and then in Portuguese controlled areas you see more mulattoes who um, have some African heritage, and then um, Portugal 
if you remember, um, the Portuguese colonies typically have a lot more racial mixing going on. Um, and then at the bottom, sorry, it's kind of cut off a little bit. Um, at the bottom, you have the Amer Indians and um, Amer Indians and Africans. Um, the these guys occupy the bulk of um, the population. Um, the Africans obviously have been displaced. Um, they were forced, it's a forced migration into the New World. Um, so that just kind of gives you an overview of the social situation that we're working with. It's very distinctive to Latin America. Um, the causes of our revolution, we have several causes here. Hi, Caramba! Okay, that's so startling, I'm sorry. Um, first of all, um, we're going to have enlightenment ideas that are going to filter in, especially these ideas of limited government, like from Montesquieu, um, Voltaire and Rousseau's ideas of individual liberties are going to be very influential in this region. Um, they're also inspired by the successes of the French and the American revolutions. Um, Simone Bolivar, in particular, really likes the American system of federalism. Um, so out beside this, um, I want you to make a note of what federalism is, and it's when the state government is controlled by a central authority. So, like, in, after the Articles of Confederation was replaced with the United States Constitution and it was established a federal system of government, Simone Bolivar really admired that system and wanted to um, transport it down to Latin America. Um, and again, the federal system is when you have the state government that's under the power of a stronger national government. Um, and Simone Bolivar is going to lead a lot of our revolutions in Latin America. Um, he's very influential, um, and he has this goal for an independent South American state called Gran Colombia. He wants to like replicate the United States system of government in South America. Um, in Latin America, they're very resentful of the mercantilist economy. Um, you remember the mercantilist economy is where Spain and Portugal, in this instance, are going to extract raw materials from the colonies and force them to buy finished manufactured products, um, which leaves the colonies very dependent on the mother country. And they want to be able to develop their own industries, um, basically kind of have more access to wealth, more greater opportunities to increase the wealth of the area. Um, and one thing that's really unique to Latin America um, is the social inequality in the economies. So make sure you guys put a star by this one because it's very distinctive to Latin America. Um, your Creoles are resentful of the Peninsulares because the Peninsulares have the biggest land holdings. They're the ones that have all the power in government. Um, so the Creoles are wanting to be able to like, participate in government, um, to be able to pretty much run the show. They don't want to establish equality. They don't want more opportunities for the mestizos, mulattoes, Amerindians, and Africans. Basically, what they want to do is push the peninsulares out and kind of claim their position as the top. They really want to keep this social hierarchy. However, the mestizos, um, who are about 25% of the population, um, are resentful of not only the peninsulares, but also the creole. So there's a class tension up and down this pyramid here. Um, the Creoles don't like the Peninsular, actually nobody except for Peninsulares like them, but however, um, the Mestizos, Mulattoes, Amerindians, your indigenous people, and the Africans also resent the Creoles for the power that they have. And in this case, power means land. Um, double underline this next point, the crisis back in Spain, because um, it is very influential in shaping our revolutions. Okay, so if you remember when we talked about our, La our French Revolution, sorry, we talked about Napoleon just kind of bulldozing through Europe, conquering everything, um, he puts a huge crisis, he puts Spain in a huge crisis because when they protest his invasion, um, he removes the Spanish king from the throne, 
um, the Spanish monarchy flees the country, and Napoleon replaces him with his brother Joseph Bonaparte. Um, and it leads to this crisis, this question of legitimacy. If you guys remember um, from government classes or your readings, like in order for an authoritarian ruler to work, people have to recognize his legitimacy, that he has a reason to rule over them, basically. Um, the legitimacy means that they're recognizing his authority. And when Napoleon replaces the Spanish king with Joseph, people do not recognize the legitimacy of Joseph. So there's a huge crisis. They're starting to rebel against the monarchy. Um, and the Creoles actually chose this moment to try to get control of their own colonies. They realize that Spain is occupied trying to keep, take control of its own um, government, um, settle its people down on you know, the borders of actual Spain. Um, and the Creoles basically take advantage of this weakness, and that's when they start to push for their independence. Um, however, Brazil has a different story. Um, they actually transitioned to independence much e more easily than Spanish colonies did. Um, Brazil's revolution was nonviolent, so um, if you will put in parentheses out by Brazil that their revolution was nonviolent, basically um, the Portuguese king realizes what's happening and he s sees that Brazil's independence is pretty much a foregone conclusion. Um, you know, it's inevitable. So what he does is he puts his son on the throne in Brazil. The Portuguese king puts his son on the throne in Brazil and kind of make everybody happy. Um, says to his son, like, look, you're going to go down here. You're going to control it. But what you're going to do is declare its independence. Um, so Portugal, in essence, kind of gives up Brazil, let, allows them to have their own freedom, and they're able to do it in a nonviolent manner. Okay, so we're going to focus first on South America before we transition back up into Mexico. Um, South American Revolution is led by this guy, Simon Bolivar, um, who has this very intense outfit. Um, Bolivar begins the revolution in 1810, and he's pretty much like the George Washington of South America. Um, he is a fantastic general, he's very charismatic, he's very popular, and he leads um, several successful independence movements. Um, his nickname was the Liberator um, because he was freeing so many people from European control, and his dream here is a united Latin America, similar to what the United States was. Um, he had this grand vision of um, all these United States and Latin America working together under one central government. Um, however, it fails miserably because South America is a ginormous territory. Um, to kind of put it in perspective, Brazil is the same size as the United States, excluding Alaska. Um, so he's pretty much operating in northern South America. Um, he's up around Colombia, Panama, Venezuela, Ecuador. So he's in the northern half um, of South America. And when he's trying, when he's leading these independence movements, he's calling on all classes to unite. Um, he even says that he would free the slaves. Um, but he's really not so much concerned about social equality. Um, and he's actually extremely concerned about the lower classes rising up and overthrowing the Creoles. Um, so he does manage to establish this united South America called Gran Colombia, and it lasts for a few years. Um, and so, I'm sorry, it cut off at the bottom. Eventually, Gran Colombia falls apart into different states. So Gran Colombia is going to fall apart into several different states. Um, they all become independent countries. So, unfortunately, um, Simon Bolivar and Gran Colombia are going to learn that nothing lasts forever. So it's a hard lesson for Mr. Bolivar. Um, our other big liberator independence movement is um, Jose de San Martin. He's operating in the southern half of South America. Um, we're talking Argentina, Chile. Um, so he's moving in the lower half of South America. Um, and he actually meets up with Simon Bolivar in Ecuador. 
and they agree to work together to unite and free the entire continent from Spanish rule. So by 1825, these two generals have helped free all of South America from Spanish rule. Um, here is a painting of San Martin on the right and Simon Bolivar in Ecuador on July 26th, um, which signaled the successful conclusion of the campaign to liberate South America from Spanish control. So these guys pretty much have an agreement that I'll work from the north, you work from the south, and we'll meet together and everybody will be free. Um, and check out these sweet sideburns here. That's some intense facial hair. Okay, you guys should have this map of um, Latin America in your notes. It's just a helpful visual to um, explain each of these areas and independence movements. Um, Haiti begins in 1804. Um, Brazil and just kind of gives you a timeline and brief overview of our independence movements. Okay, so now we're going to switch and we're going to talk about Mexico. Mexico is a very different story. Um, the Mexican Revolution Movement begins in 1810, um, and it's led by, it's characterized, I'm sorry, by violence and a real lack of corporate uh, cooperation between your social classes. Um, in the Mexican Independence Movement, pretty much everybody's fighting everybody. Um, and I want you to um, star this third bullet um, Father Miguel Hidalgo is considered like the leader of this Mexican independence movement. But what's significant about it is that it's a lower class based movement. I want you to underline that phrase, lower class based movement. It is our only lower class based movement um, in all of our revolutions. Um, American Revolution, it was led by pretty much upper middle class um, landholders to secure property rights. French Revolution, it began in the upper levels of the third estate. Haiti, it, um, Toussaint Louverture was a successful general. Um, all of our other revolutions are led by um, Creoles or upper class. Mexico is the only one that's led by lower class. Um, However, because it's a lower class based movement, um, it's very threatening to the upper classes and their status. So the Creoles and the Peninsulares are very concerned about this movement um, and they actually stop Hidalgo in 1811. He's executed. Um, but another priest, Jose Morelos, picks up his fight. So what's important is that in Mexico, you actually have three different groups that are fighting each other for independence. Um, you have Spain, who's fighting to maintain control. You have the poor Mexicans, who are fighting to increase their status. And the upper class Mexicans, who are fighting to preserve their status. So, um, Mexico, you've got three groups fighting against each other. Okay, Jose Morelos picks up after Hidalgo. Um, and he's pretty ahead of his time here. He's, I would say, very socially liberal. Um, he has demands for, like, the abolition of slavery. He wants to get rid of slavery in Mexico. Um, he really wants to work for land reform, which is redistribution. So what we saw in Mexico and throughout Latin America is that the land was pretty much in the hands of the Creoles and the Peninsulares. Your lower classes, mestizos, mulattoes, and especially not your indigenous people or Africans, um, had really no access to land. So he wanted to redistribute this land and give land from the upper classes to the peasants and allow them to improve their station in life. Um, and he has this really interesting quote here where he says, We demand a new government by which all inhabitants except peninsulares would no longer be designated as Indians, mulattoes, or castas, which are people of mixed race, but all would be known as Americans. So he wants to throw off these old ideas and embrace your new identity as an American. Um, 
However, Morelos, with his radical ideas of basically <clears throat> undoing the economic system in Latin America, these cash crop economies, um, he's captured and executed by the upper classes in 1815, and the revolution becomes Creole-led in Mexico. <clears throat> it's replaced by Augustin de Iturbide, who is a Creole leader who eventually leads Mexico to independence from Spain in 1820. Um, he declares himself emperor with the help of the military, and I would put air quotes around emperor um, because he really doesn't have the status, the claims that go with being an emperor. He's more like <clears throat> a military dictator. Um, he rises up through the power of the military, not through um, hereditary rule. And, I mean, it's not like he controls a lot of areas outside of just Mexico. And he eventually is ousted in favor of another general, um, Santa Ana. And this is going to be a common theme from here on out in Latin America. Okay, so we're going to talk about the issues for these Latin American revolutions. Um, one thing that comes out of here is that in Latin America, um, we have one crop economies, which are a huge problem. Even after they um, gain their independence, we have a monocrop economy that continues. So it's still a cash crop based economy. Latin America is going to continue to export cash crops, which are, you know, are low value, while importing high value manufactured goods. And the system continues because we still have the Creoles who are the majority landowners. So, even though we're exporting low-value goods, if you export enough low-value goods, you still make a lot of money. However, not everybody is sharing in the wealth here. Um, much of Latin America is still very poor um, because most of them are working for the Creoles who actually own the land. So, they're importing high value of goods. So imbalance of trade here. Which also leads us to the question of land. Um, these landless peasants, the mestizos and the Merindians, remain a huge problem for Latin America. You have sub millions of kind of disenfranchised people. And what they're hoping for is land redistribution, that the um, Creoles will, that whole one cash, cash crop economy system will kind of fade out and it will open up more economic opportunities for your lower classes. And what they're really hoping for is power. And in, this system I want you to put out beside it, land equals power. Um, if you have land and you have power, you have more economic opportunities, opportunities for wealth and political power. So in Latin America, as in other places, um, land is going to be indicative of, of the power that you have. Um, the power of the Catholic Church continues. If you remember, um, the Catholic Church was hugely influential in the establishment of these colonies. Um, the church and the state were very closely linked at this time, um, and it was a good unifier. It pretty much unified across social classes throughout Latin America, um, and its status and its power continues. Um, it maintains control of education, and the Catholic Church um, continues to be one of the wealthier institutions in Latin America. Um, but one of its primary functions that I would emphasize is its role in uniting people. You have a common culture. Um, and to this day, the majority of Christians in Latin America are Catholic. It's a very strong presence in Latin America. Even our Pope is Argentinian, it's the first New World Pope. Okay. One thing that comes out of Latin America is going to be the Caudillo system, um, and put a big star with Caudillos. These guys are military leaders that are hugely popular, and they kind of start to run the show. And an example of this would be 
um, our Mexican revolutionary Iturbide. So I would kind of put his name in parentheses out here as an example of it. Um, these guys rise up through the military and eventually take control of everything. They eventually become military dictator dictators. And you have a system here that reinforces it. If you consider that you have a cash crop economy, high rates of illiteracy, at this point 75 to 85 percent of Latin America is illiterate. Um, you have no experience in self-government. Um, it leads to dictatorships run by military leaders. They would, the people in Latin America would prefer the stability of a dictator rather than the equality of pure democracy. So they're willing to give up their equality, their personal liberties, um, in exchange for the stability that dictators offer. Okay, and finally we have the issue of slavery in Latin America. If you remember from the slave trade, the majority of our slaves are actually going to Latin America, um, especially the Caribbean and Brazil. Um, as an institution, slavery remains. It's not immediately wiped out as they gain independence, but gradually emancipation is taking place. And I need you guys to put a star by um, Brazil because it's a pretty common question to know that um, Brazil was the last state to abolish slavery. Um, Brazil does not end the institution of slavery until 1888. Um, so make sure that you emphasize that one. Um, a lot of times you'll be asked to know what was the last state to abolish slavery and it was Brazil. Um, and similar to other members of the lower class, just because they've been emancipated does not immediately improve the status of slaves. Um, many of them remain impoverished, similar to the other members of the lower classes. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up Latin American independence movements. Make sure that you guys um, keep up with your notes. Make sure you bring these with any questions with you to class next time that we meet. Um, make sure that you guys are keeping up with your readings and we will continue from there.